I was asked by the, and invited by MSD to talk briefly on a subject which uh, is actually the highlight of our daily practice. Uh, the only problem which we face in prescribing DB4 inhibitors or SGLT2s, especially SGLT2s, is the price. But this will change uh, sooner or later, I think, and we will uh, tackle or we will face this dilemma which drug to prescribe to whom, uh, or maybe both drugs to everybody from the outset of the diabetes, because it's also one of the uh, discussed options. Uh, so I will try to present some sort of evidence and also the way of thinking which is now prevalent uh, with some perspective in near future. Because looking at the guidelines, how they are published today, uh, we can clearly have some suspicions what will happen next year and what will be the suggestions for the treatment of type 2 diabetes with oral agents. So the story, as we know, started with Incred and Hormones. They were introduced in 2005, not very uh, long time ago. We know what is uh, exciting in them. It's increasing insulin secretion without uh, causing hypoglycemia, just as much insulin as necessary. It's decreasing glucagon secretion. This is a very important action, central action of GLP-1s, and now it is used in obesity treatment, just decreasing satiety, uh, decreasing uh, hunger, increasing satiety, and the action on stomach, which is different between different agents, whether they are uh, GLP-1s, whether they come from Exendin, or whether they have been uh, synthetically uh, produced. So we, we learned a lot over a decade how this drug acts. Uh, GLP-1 is in injections. It is an obstacle for many patients, also for us, and it's expensive. So the companies uh, bring up the oral agents which block degrading of native GLP-1, and Cetagliptin was uh, actually the first one which hit the market, and it still has like 70% of market worldwide in US. And this is one of the nicest study with Cetagliptin. You must have seen it a few times. When it's compared to sulfonylurea, with the same efficacy in terms of lowering HB1C or fasting plasma glucose, but with virtual no hypoglycemia. In this study, 5% of patients had hypoglycemia on cetagliptin and a third on sulfonylurea. Uh, as we know how uh, incretin agents work, we know that this 5% were really symptoms perhaps of hypo, but it was hardly a real hypoglycemia. And we can use this, these agents freely. Uh, they are on top of this without any uh, side effects, in fact, and in many countries have been used by uh, general practitioners and have become the second agent after metformin. Uh, Cetagliptin was also the subject of cardiovascular outcome trial. As we know, the study which was, this is an interesting story because this was, I think, the third CVOT study published and at that time, the companies raised hopes that we will have a wonderful study with over 10,000 patients, and, and, and we do expect some additional important evidence, apart from that it lowers blood glucose. But as we know, all DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, CVOTs, just show that they are safe in terms of cardiovascular safety. Uh, there is no sign of any, no signal of any danger, but why should it be? So this was somehow accepted with a disappointment because the hopes were raised, not just by MSD, by all the companies, by various meta-analyses, but on the other hand, if we think that it was just a safety trial, so it, it just confirmed the drug is safe, but it provided other additional information. We learned that if we use cetagliptin, we may delay insulin therapy uh, substantially in many patients. So this is basically what now oral treatment is about, not just decreasing cardiovascular risk or nephropathy risk, but also about delaying injectable treatment. So this was, as I said, at the beginning disappointing, later it was all accepted. All DPP-4 CVOTs trials gave the similar results, but due to the safety and the relatively easy use of the drugs with no side effects, this is the table 
I guess it has already five years old. If you look here, in countries like Germany, DP4 inhibitors were at that time, a few years ago, already used twice as often as sulfonylurea, and this trend only increases. There are very few countries in which sulfonylurea use is widely maintained, and it comes, it's caused largely by the government who simply decides to pay for some drugs or not pay for other drugs, and some uh, regulatory bodies which tells doctor use sulfonylurea because you use anything new. Uh, in UK, sulfonylurea is also popular in the Netherlands, and in most European countries and US, of course, uh, DP4 inhibitors have become the second use, the second agent after metformin. And then only seven years ago, exactly seven years ago, in November 2012, dapagliflozin was uh, registered by European Union in Europe, the drug which we now know very well how it works. Yes, it blocks the reabsorption of glucose and sodium in the kidneys, but it also does many other things. We are not fully sure what they do or how they work. This is just an example. That's one of the early papers from 2014 showing that dapagliflozin uh, in fact leads to the increase, as you can see here, of glucagon, and we know that these drugs now can do it. That leads to the increase of hepatic glucose production. Overall, the drugs, of course, lower blood glucose, but somehow they make, uh, make liver produce glucose exactly at the same amount what glucose is lost with the urine. So that's kind of interesting that what liver does uh, somehow balances what patients loses with the urine. I guess we underappreciate, as we all are sitting here, the doctors, but even let alone the patients or nurses, we underappreciate how carefully designed machines we are to preserve energy we ever absorb. We know that it's very difficult to lose weight, it's very easy to gain weight, but this is one of the examples. And the same happened with SGLT2 inhibitors. These drugs make our bodies lose energy, so the bodies work diff on different ways just to save this energy, to keep glucose level, to pretend nothing really happens. So this is one thing which we thought, we, we don't really know what to think about, it. is it uh, favorable or not. It's not unfavorable, I guess, but perhaps it would be better if there was no rising glucagon levels. On the other hand, it is argued that these high levels, higher levels of glucagon help the failing heart because glucagon has an inotropic, positive inotropic effect. More studies needed, as we say. We also learned that SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, they were greeted with, uh, well, with mixed feelings, I would say. I remember my thinking, my colleagues, when they, uh, when the first, it was a BMS company which produced the first, uh, which was responsible for dapagliflozin, and they, when they come to us telling us about these drugs, we were really skeptical, because I still remember times when patients did not have glucose meters, and the only way to assess their glucose control was to take a urine sample every two weeks to the lab, and if there was no glucose in urine sample, <coughs> that when that glucose is, uh, diabetes is well controlled. And now we are causing uh, mega glycosuria if you've ever managed or your patient measured glucose levels in urine taking SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, and this was another study which was somehow surprising because we would expect that someone who's using 300 calories per day with SGLT2 inhibitors will lose weight consistently and maybe even the weight may normalize. Uh, so this, was, this is the expected body weight in men and women. But this is what happens in reality. The weight comes down for two, three months, and then it levels off. And it happens in both genders. And these are the analysis from empagliflos and trials from empiric outcome. And what they measured in this study, and we were, they were lucky to do it, and we were lucky to learn from it, is that what very much, very well corresponds to this period of weight loss, the patients at the beginning when they start using SGLT2 inhibitors, they do not eat more, they maintain their energy intake, but after a month or two they start eating more, and that's why they stop losing weight. They start eating more without being aware of it, 
This is the hormones which make them eat more. So that's kind of amazing. And nowadays when I'm prescribing SGLT2 inhibitor, I always tell the patients, and okay, if you want to lose weight, be careful that if you have, well, in Poland we eat sandwiches for breakfast. So be careful to have two sandwiches. You're having two sandwiches, okay, keep the, with these two sandwiches per day. Do not have four sandwiches in a month or two. It sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. So with all these mixed feelings, then, as we know, empiric outcome results arrived. One of those CVOTs trial, and the first one published with SGLT2 inhibitor. And this is where the whole well, bomb exploded. Because what happened after September 2015 is really, well, at a diabetes pace, but it is really a revolution in, in our thinking and guidelines. And it has already been mentioned here a few times. This striking and very significant difference in cardiovascular mortality reduction by almost 40%. Also, if we look at those three-point maze in other agents, this is empagliflozin, this is canagliflozin, we have a significant reduction in conglomerate out uh, endpoint with cardiovascular death, MIs, and strokes. Uh, we now know that this is largely driven by improvement in or reducing the risk for heart failure hospitalization, which we've never really considered before as an issue in diabetes. I don't think any of you, if you, uh, if you answer it honestly, would say, oh, yeah, yeah, before empire outcome, I always looked at the diabetes as a disease uh, which leads to a heart failure. We know, we know that there is a sort of uh, diastolic heart failure, which we now call uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But it was really not an area of any interest. It's also difficult to treat, so not much to do for us. Nowadays, heart failure has become uh, a big, big issue, if not the leading uh, complication of diabetes. But one thing to remember in these studies is that all the patients which took part in uh, cardiovascular outcomes trials, because this is what FDA asked the companies to do, was to enroll patients at, of high cardiovascular risk. And again, that's an example from Empiric Outcome. Almost half of patients had a history of MI, and a quarter had a history of stroke. This is a huge overrepresentation of these patients comparing to regular population, because whether it is uh, assessed in Egypt, US, Poland, or anywhere in the world, usually no more than 5% of type 2 diabetes population has suffered, have suffered stroke. Here we have five times more patients. So we have patients at high risk, and this was designed also because to see the effects quickly in a few years. But if we look at other studies, I'm not sure how, it's not very clear, unfortunately. But this line shows how many patients had cardiovascular disease in all but one published CVOTs today. And those ratio, this percentage, uh, is between 40% to 100%. So in a few studies, in, in majority of studies, it was majority of patients with already established cardiovascular disease, and some of them, two or three, it was, well, only 40%. So no wonder having seen such a data, ADA and ESD last year published their new version of the statement. There will be a new one probably published next year, as far as I know. Is this thinking about it being provoked by ESC? I will. I uh, mentioned this in a moment. And we all have seen this colorful figure many times. And SGLT2s dominated this algorithm. From left to right, from top to bottom, uh, it's mentioned, I think, like 13 times here, even in the pathway where cost is a major issue. And even if you think that uh, in rich countries, cost is not a major issue, perhaps the only country where it is really not an issue is Switzerland where everything is reimbursed immediately and it's a filthy rich country. But if you think about the US, that's not an option. In US, drugs are very expensive, especially insulin. Uh, this is something very strange what is happening there in that regard. So SGLT2 has been, as you see, they, you may, we may be given in patients, and we should be given to patients with complications, cardiovascular or microvascular complications. And equally, GLP-N receptor agonists are mentioned here. This is also an under, maybe not now, but last year I would say it is an underappreciated phenomenon because for the first time in the history of treating diabetes, we have the anti-diabetic agents 
who are not just lowering blood glucose, not just preventing macro or microvascular complications, but these are the drugs which uh, prevent macro complications and slower the pace, slower the development of micro complications like uh, chronic kidney disease. So that's, that's a sort of unique group of drugs. But, there's always some but, this has been well proven in patients who already had some vascular damage. And whether it is for the patients without any vascular damage, would it work the same way? It's difficult to say. I also always say that I would doubt whether SGLT2 inhibitors, they are wonderful anti-diabetes drugs, but I would doubt whether in someone with a healthy heart, someone who had no MI and no signs of heart failure whatsoever, whether it would improve heart function. Uh, how can you improve a heart function or function of anything which functions well? It cannot make the heart contract even better if the heart contracts uh, well enough and normally. But this, again, we need more studies. I'm not sure they will ever be done because they would have to last much longer. Also, DPP4 inhibitors remained, of course, in this algorithm. They are mentioned fewer times, but also in every column uh, they might be considered. We, they are just without this property of reducing vascular risk. But on the other hand, they are the safest drugs we have for type 2 diabetes, as they cause no uh, side effects. So we might think about choosing the second and third agent and making this uh, last year algorithm uh, a little bit simpler. That if a patient has no vascular complications, micro, macro, or has it, this is what we should do. This all, and whenever I'm saying this, whether it is in Polish, in English, and sometimes I struggle to have lectures in Russian, uh, I always tell it to myself, because I also learn, I try to teach myself how I should now look at the patients. So we are less nowadays probably interested in having HbA1c at the target. It is always important, will always be. But our first decision should be made uh, based on the presence or absence of vascular complications. And if a, presence, if a patient has no complications, they're relatively newly diagnosed, that's one of the options to consider, metformin plus DP4 inhibitor, and then SGLT2 could be added. We simply shouldn't lose the opportunity offered by DP4 inhibitors by incretins. But if someone <coughs> excuse me, has vascular complications, then SGLT2, so then the second, the third agent should be GLP1 receptor agonist. That makes this therapy really expensive. And we have to wait two, three more years for uh, biosimilar at least the raglutide to make its price cheaper. You might even consider pyoglitazone here, which has some good data on preventing second myocardial infarction, but of course is contraindicated <coughs> in a heart failure. So that might not be a very good idea for every patient. But then, just two weeks before Barcelona meeting, is the Barcelona meeting where I guess many of you uh, have uh, been, ESC produces this set of guidelines together with EASD. And you already saw this title, and it was even, the slide was titled, it's ESC and ESD guidelines. And that's an extremely funny thing, because EASD doesn't know what to think about it, I can tell you. This was published briefly before Barcelona meeting, and it was not mentioned during Barcelona at all. And this is a very brave statement, this guidelines. I'll show you in a moment, I guess you know, uh, what I mean. Uh, the title is weird. It's ESC guidelines. So the guidelines are of ESC, but they have been prepared in collaboration with ESD. What it means, no one really knows, but I can tell you where it comes from. Because at that time, uh, in the previous edition, six years earlier, I was the member of executive committee, and ESC approached ESD it just, j just to let you know how things like that uh, become and happen. ESC approached ESD saying, look, we prepared guidelines to treat and prevent cardiovascular disease in diabetes. We would like you, ESD, to endorse it, to be part of it. But the guidelines had 200 pages. And the current the president at the time and the board said, no, no, we can't uh, sign the guidelines which are 200 pages. Maybe cardiologists are used to uh, then to, to have guidelines that long. In diabetes, we cannot. We mostly work for and with general practitioners. No one will read 200-page guidelines. 
but ESC insisted. So this was the formula which was invented. Okay, so this will be ESC guidance in collaboration with the ESD. Which, not, which means that ESD doesn't really know whether it is a father or mother of this paper or not. And, but every one of us understands that, it's, yeah, it's ESC and ESD guidelines. So that's a funny thing in terms from the academic point of view. And uh, I, I'm not going into this in detail. There are many interesting things there. Uh, very, uh, how to say it, very uh, new. Uh, and I'm saying it very ironically. Because they say, for example, well, if you want to diagnose IgT, you have to perform oral glucose tolerance test, and that's a recommendation. Well, that's been known for like 40 years now, so the cardiologists have just discovered it. But this is the figure which really raises uh, eyebrows, and we don't know what to think about. Because if you look at it carefully, if you look at the upper left hand corner, it says that patients who are drug naive and have atero, like it says here, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or, at, or are at high or very high risk and high is just diabetes, type 2 diabetes over 10 years and a single risk factor. Uh, so these patients should be given as a first agent SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP1 receptor agonist. And then if HbA1c is above target, this is where target is analyzed, not at the beginning, not at the first step, but the second step, uh, we should add metformin. So this is the first set of guidelines which really uh, kicked metformin out of the leading place after 60 years, and it wasn't really diabetologists who did it. So that's interesting. Uh, it's not evidence, really, because all CVOT uh, projects have been conducted in patients, majority of them took metformin, and then they got new drug. But I, uh, you may think that I criticize it. I, I, I really don't. I think it's a step into, in the right direction. Because what this document says is do not wait. Just add uh, drugs which reduce cardiovascular risk in patients who are like, in pa like patients in CVOT, so with cardiovascular disease or high cardiovascular risk. Do not wait. Start with this drug, and then you may add metformin. But I actually think it will go, we, we will have some compromise, because what will be said is, okay, so uh, start with the newer agents, but why should you, shouldn't you start with metformin at the same time? So the next issue of this guidelines or ESD guidelines perhaps will be start with combination metformin with other agents together, and we will not be very original to do so. If you look where SGLT2s are mentioned on the pathway when patients are on metformin, this also should be a second drug in patients with complications. But DPP4 inhibitors remained as the first drug of all the other options here. The order of the drugs here is not coincidental. It's, been, it's on purpose DPP4s are first in here, and TZDs, for example, are the last in this row. And why I'm saying we will not be original in using combination as a first step? Because we basically follow cardiologists. We basically follow hypertensiologists. They have more data, more studies with larger group of patients, and they have more patients, especially a blood pressure specialists. And if you look at the guidelines from 2018 on how to manage hypertension, and I guess you also, we also know all, at least if you haven't read them, you heard about them, the major difference which has been introduced there, and without any or much controversy, everybody accepted this, that today when we start treating hypertension, we, do, we should start with combining ACE inhibitor or LARPs uh, with calcium channel blocker or diuretic, and you have drugs like that produced by your companies who are easily advertised outside in the, in the lobby. But they should be in one pill. And then if we think the patient needs three drugs, then we use any drugs out of these three or four groups also in one pill. And the second pill for hypertension uh, comes to the use only when spironolactone traditionally as a fourth drug is used. This is the general algorithm. Of course, there are many subgroups with the elderly, with coronary heart disease, and so on, which require separate treatment. And I wonder, have it ever come to your mind that diabetes uh, hypertension also is a chronic disease, but it is much less complex in terms of pathophysiology than type 2 diabetes. 
Type 2 diabetes is a, has a much more complicated origin, and it is also a progressive disease. Once it starts, it never sleeps. The glucose will deteriorate well if we remain patient on one agent. So having hypertension, which is much more stable and less complex, treated with fixed dose combination from the beginning, perhaps what we should expect or even ask our uh, guidelines experts to do so is to pr produce something like this. This is, of course, my own speculation, so uh, the, I have no quote citing for the citation for this. But I guess this is the direction we are heading that we will have diabetes with complications started, without complications, started with DP4 inhibitor, preferably in one pill, and we have such preparation. And then SGLT2 will be added. We have, uh, there is a citagliptin and eritogliflos not available everywhere yet, but in one pill as well. It's available in my country, not reimbursed yet. Uh, it would be nice if they have metformin as a third drug in this pill. And then there are even some place here for sulfonylurea as well. But if we have a patient with cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney disease, he should be or she should be getting metformin with SGLT2 inhibitor, then GLP receptor agonist, and then perhaps this pyoglitazole. But it is not probably that simple. Again, just to complicate it a little more, and I have a few, three, four more slides before I end, uh, because. There are some obstacles. If we use SGLT2s in patients with chronic kidney disease, they uh, pretty quickly, these drugs, lose, lose their glucose lowering potency. They are still, and that's very interesting, they still prevent kidneys or kidney disease to, from progressing, but they do not lower glucose anymore. And there is a study which confirms it in a way, that's the comparison of cetagliptin versus dapagliflozin in patients with moderate kidney failure, the mean GFR, EGFR was around 70. And as you can see here, uh, in lowering, and this came as a surprise actually for the company, for the investigators, that using cetagliptin in these patients lowered HbA1c more than, did, than dapagliflozin did. It's not that dapagliflozin is a weaker or worse drug, it's simply when kidney fails, the ability of uh, not uh, of increasing uh, glucose excretion by kidneys by SGLT2 inhibitors diminishes, while DP4 inhibitors still retain their mode of action and their efficacy. The same uh, we may see in this sort of comparison, what percentage of patients reached the goal below 7% after six months, it was higher, and this was statistically significant with cetagliptin. So as much as SGLT2 inhibitors prevent kidney failure, and they perhaps should be used in Denmark. I have colleagues in Denmark who told me, look, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are licensed to be used to EGFR of 45, but we are using it uh, off-label to the level of 15, just uh, wanting to prevent or to slower chronic kidney disease progression. But they don't lower glucose anymore. So perhaps we will be combining those two new drugs more and more often if price permits. So just to summarize, if we look at these two drugs, how to combine them, what to use after metformin, if we look, just to make a few clear statements on DP4 inhibitors and SGLT2 inhibitors, DP4 inhibitors are effective, they cause no hypoglycemia, they are weight neutral, they are neutral in terms of affecting vascular, both macro and microvascular risk, they have no side effects, no appreciable side effects, but their efficacy is related to the preservation of beta cell function. This is clear from the mechanisms of action of all incretin agents. They need beta cell to make insulin released in a proper and more physiological fashion. That's why they should rather be used, as I said, not to lose the opportunity of using these drugs uh, use early. With SGLT2 inhibitors, there are some similarities. They are effective, they cause no hypoglycemia, they lead to the weight loss, they lead to the reduction of vascular complication risk. They do have side effects, they are reported, they should be expected, and we always, whenever I prescribe and my colleagues, and I guess so do you, uh, we warn patients and inform that the issue of mycotic genital infections might arise. Uh, again, just a practical hint, I have a patient, some patients sometimes coming to me from long distances, like from, uh, I work in Warsaw, which is in central Poland, 
and there are patients coming from uh, afar, like three to uh, two, three hundred kilometers away. And I usually, when I prescribe them SGLT2 inhibitor, I at the same time prescribe them antimycotic agent, telling them if anything happens, just take these pills, three pills, like fluconazole, 150 milligrams or 100 milligrams, and that works. So that makes this prescription a little bit more complicated. And efficacy in terms of lowering blood glucose is related to the preservation of renal function. So this is, I guess, the points we should consider when we think about combining which agent should go with which, uh, with, with metformin as a second one today, remembering that these two main facts are common. They are equally effective and they are, one more slide please, or uh, they are equally effective and they, are, they cause no hypoglycemia, and we are now nowadays able to treat patients with our hypos, which is a great news for the patients and for us. The differences are here, uh, and this is where we should think uh, when we differentiate which patient should receive which drug. But perhaps the future is not DP4 inhibitor or SGLT2 inhibitor, but simply plus. Different mechanisms, fix those combination, early treatment to delay insulin therapy, which has been shown in other studies, which you know they were presented in Barcelona. That's the direction I'm pretty convinced we will be heading. Thank you very much for your attention.